So, Michael, I mean, the we will hear uh, a lot of I mean, we hear a lot of this just in the in the wake of of Harvey. We will hear it um, in regards to Irma that um, people are taking the opportunity of politicizing. And, you know, there's a there's a lot to talk about in terms of the response and in terms of what was done to to mitigate uh, what happened in uh, in Houston and in Texas uh, in uh, as a function of Harvey. But um, people talk about uh, that uh, people interpret this as having to do with global warming because of an agenda. Will you uh, please explain to us um, to what extent can we talk about climate change in regard to causality and to the implications of of Harvey? Uh, sure. So, you know, there, I think there's an effort by some to try to stop that conversation before it begins, um, uh, to sort of set the rules in such a way that scientists are afraid uh, to talk about the, the context uh, for the storm provided by climate change. Um, and unfortunately, you see the same sort of thing when we have you know, a very unfortunate mass shooting where uh, obviously the issue of gun control is relevant to the topic, but you'll have the NRA come out and say, oh, let's not politicize this by talking about uh, gun control, when in fact that is, you know, the lack of, of common sense gun laws is, is part of the reason for the tragedy. Um, it's sort of analogous here where climate change deniers, fossil fuel interests, and the front groups that advocate for them don't want the the public to start to connect the dots that the increased damage and destruction we're seeing with these storms is related to the fact that we're warming the planet, we're warming the, the oceans, there's more energy in these storms, there's a worse storm surge because of sea level rise. Um, there are some who find it very inconvenient um, for, you know, uh, for the public to, to, to connect those dots. Um, and so that's why, in, in my view, it's essential that we do that. And we do that in a way that is respectful of the tragedy that uh, is unfolding. Um, you know, and, you know, uh, many of us have friends and, and family who are in Texas and Florida. And obviously uh, we feel tremendously for the folks that are suffering the impacts of these storms. And part of why we are talking about the climate connection is to make sure that we take the steps necessary to prevent further harm and further destruction, uh, which means, first of all, stemming the problem uh, at its source, which is stopping you know, our continued uh, expanding uh, reliance on fossil fuels and moving away towards uh, uh, renewable energy uh, to, to, to stop the additional warming of the planet and the warming of the oceans that is creating this problem, and by putting in place measures, common sense measures, um, to help people cope with the impacts of these storms, uh, adaptations, coastal defenses, levee systems. Uh, ironically, uh, as you're probably aware, um, just weeks before Harvey mm. struck, the Trump administration had actually done away with policies that were put in place under the previous administration to make sure that climate uh, change related um, threats that sea level rise in particular um, is taken into account in our you know, uh, coastal um, uh, land use policies and common sense um, sort of regulations for, for where uh, you can build and where you can't. Um, so it's it's sort of, you know, it's unfortunate that some of the same folks, some of the same groups who, who don't want to talk about how climate change is making these events worse um, also don't want to support policies to help people um, cope with the impact that climate right. change is already having and indeed often favor policies that are exacerbating the problem. Right. I mean, there's no there's no coincidence there. Right. I mean, the the uh, silence in and in, in how you uh, deal with both um, how you deal with the events like this. Um, uh, before and after the fact, of course, is in and of itself a politicization exactly. of uh, of the event. All right, well, let's go through from a scientific— I have a term for it, by the way. Please. <laughs> um, I call this Sandy silence. 
because uh. whether it was Superstorm Sandy or the Sandy Hook tragedy, <laughs> vested interests don't want us to be talking about the very factors that are exacerbating and creating these problems. Well, let's talk about the, uh, let's break it down, because in, in your Guardian piece, you um, uh, pretty meticulously break down um, the, the elements that essentially take, and uh, these are my words, not yours, but I, I would imagine, and, and please tell me if you don't agree, that basically what we're talking about are storms, are weather events that might be one in 100 years or one in 200 years or one in 500 years, and yep. they are happening more frequently, and they become more like, uh, or, or they go from one in 100 years to one in 1,000 year type of weather events. Um, that's what it seems to be going on, that yep. the, the odds of, a, of a, a black swan type of event, all of a sudden yep. a lot of black swans are showing up. Right, exactly. And that's because we are loading the dice. We are literally loading the dice uh, towards more of these destructive events. Um, and so, you know, when, when you hear uh, the, the term thousand-year event or 500-year event bandied uh, about, and you're wondering, why are we seeing so many of these 500 and thousand-year events? If these are events that should only happen once every 500 or once every thousand years, why is it that we've seen a dozen thousand-year flooding events around the U.S. over the last uh, couple of years? Um, and it's not a coincidence. Climate change is loading the dice so that what we might have described as a thousand-year event before humans started warming the planet and changing the climate isn't a thousand-year event anymore. It's maybe a 20-year event. And if we continue on the course that we're on, events like Harvey and Superstorm Sandy, which today are you know maybe 20-year events, 30-year, they, they shouldn't happen more often than every few decades, they will become interannual events. We will see a Sandy or a Harvey uh, every couple of years or every other year um, if we continue on this course of continuing to burn fossil fuels and warm the planet. So it's really up to us. Do we want to continue on that course and basically create um, uh, an environment, um, an, an atmosphere where we will ultimately have to retreat from our coastlines? We just won't be able to build coastal defenses that can deal with a Harvey or Sandy-like landfalling hurricane every other year. There's just no adaptive measures that we could take to deal with that kind of threat to our coastlines. And then we're talking about something even more expensive. We're literally talking about relocating the major coastal cities of the world and you know, more than a billion people. And, and, and I want to talk about that issue of sustainability um, in the next segment. But uh, just to um, and, and let's take a break. And when we come back, I want to go through those um, elements where you can look at as a scientist and say um, this is attributable to uh, climate change and it has this type of uh, impact on uh, a certain element of a one in 100 year, one in 200 year uh, event that um, makes it so unique and so uniquely destructive as well as lethal. Uh, we've got to take sure. a quick break. I'm talking to Professor Michael E. Mann, uh, author of uh, A Peace in the Guardian. It's a fact climate change made Hurricane Harvey more deadly. We'll be right back on Ring of Fire Radio in just a moment. 